Good afternoon. Today we have another meeting of the Expert Analytical Club. The topic is towards a new Belarus, factors of transformation. And today, on the anniversary of the March of the New Belarus, the BISS will present a study devoted to an analysis of possible scenarios for political transformation in Belarus. Our today's speakers are Mr. Piotr Rutkowski, Dr. Pimentis, Academic Director of BISS, coordinator of the study towards the New Belarus scenarios for transformation. Hello, Piotr. Next is Pavel Usov, doctoral candidate in political sciences, head of the Center of Political Analysis and Forecasting from Warsaw. Next, Vitaly Tsigankov is a political observer for Radio Liberty. Hello. Lesia Rudnik, researcher at the Center of New Ideas, doctoral student at Karlstad University, Sweden. Hello and welcome. I would like to remind you that we have an English translation available. If you prefer to listen to us in this language, please choose an appropriate audio track. Also, if you choose Russian soundtrack, you'll listen to us in a Belarusian slash Russian mode, depending on the speaker's language. The format of the club meeting is as usual, an hour for the speakers and now for the discussion in which all meeting participants can take part. I would also like to remind you that well, if you have any questions or comments during the event, feel free to raise your hand, write us in the chat. You will definitely get, get an opportunity to speak. I would also like to remind you that we are videotaping the discussion. I would also like to remind you that we apply the chat mass rule, which we have an advanced notice requirement. So if you want to say something off the record, I cannot be quoted by the panelist with your name on it. Please tell us before you say it. We'll cut it out of the record. And the other members of the club will know that with your name, such a phrase cannot be quoted. And now I give floor to my co-moderator, Vadim Mojeka. Vadim, please. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anton. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, we have a very important topic to discuss the political transformation in Belarus, something that we have this or that way been discussing over the last year, while a year ago on this day, we witnessed the march of the new Belarus and other transformations were discussed in the streets. Today we'll be looking at this situation from an analytical point of view. Today we'll start with Mr. Piotr Rutkowski, representing the BISS, research dedicated to political transformation. Piotr was one of the co-authors and coordinator of uh, this research. Then um, the speakers that we have invited will be able to share their views on the research and on the questions raised and that were announced by us. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I know that later after all speakers speak out, we'll be able to have a Q&A. Um, please feel free to send us your questions. We'll also discuss the questions you sent us during the registration stage. Now I will give floor to Piotr Rutkowski to present the major conclusions of this study. Good evening, Vadim. Thank you, all the participants, Vadim and Anton. Thank you for coming and joining this discussion. I mean, this presentation and discussion. Over the last six months, or even more, even though not in the regular way, we have been researching the transformation factors. This research was conducted under this name towards the new Belarus factors of transformation. I was one of the coordinators and I was joined by my colleagues from the BISS. Our interns made a significant contribution to this research piece. And I would like 
to say that we are ready to share you we're with your results on this day of the March anniversary. As to the status quo of the Belarusian political system the, and the prospects for transformation, we'll be happy to share our views on that. As to the latter, I'll be modest here. Possibly during the discussion phase, we'll be able to share with you uh, our views on that. With your permission, I'm starting the presentation of this research piece. A few words about the research objectives. Our main goal was to diagnose the state of Belarus autocracy. Next one was to identify the factors influencing the political transformation in Belarus. Here we were interested in four different types of factors. First and foremost, uh, those contributed to the dismantling of the autocracy. Next go factors slowing down this dismantling. A separate group consists of factors which facilitate democratization and those which hinder democratization. Here we're not putting an equality symbol between these things. These are different things. Not as every factor that prompts the overcoming the hindrance of democratization, contribute to it. This is the ambivalence. Next, our methodology. The first part is establishing the real state of affairs in the country and establishing real relevant patterns. The situation that had been forming for many years in Belarus. Based on the first and the second point, based on this solid uh, number of facts and uh, patents and regularities, we were able to understand the status quo in the country through the prism of regularities. So not only describing the current processes, but also we're able to identify the trends, tendencies, and uh, made an attempt to forecast the future. This is a, a slippery slope, we understand that, but it is possible. A few more words about methodology. The question rises, where does the data about the real state of affairs come from? Well, it's the solo sociological surveys, monitoring of the political process. Evolution focus came very handy here. I don't know if it continues, but it's a, a very solid piece of data that we used. I actually used it a lot. I used, uh, among other things, expert reports, media reports, statistical data, international indices, etc. Maybe the question, where do the patents come from, is more interesting here. In uh, social political reality, there are no strict laws, but there are some patents that are visible and easy to determine. For example, those uh, based on the previous cases and uh, life cycle of studies of fallen autocracies. In the post-war period, there were not less than 500,000 autocracies, 500 autocracies. And over the last 15 years, the interest towards the large-scale research of autocracies was rising. That means based on the lot of data. It allows to understand the patterns. Next comes the detailed case studies. For example, one of the latest cases that we were interested in was the collapse of 
of the autocracy regime in Tunisia. There are symptoms visible of uh, the rollback from uh, democracy, but maybe that's not the last we've seen of Tunisia. Maybe this crisis will be overcome. This way or the other, there is a more detailed discussion of studies and general cognitive behavioral patterns, like uh, the situation of in uncertainty when a person chooses the status quo. Also, the typical ways of perceiving risks, these things and regularities are possible to understand based on the cognitive cognitivist approach and general data. You don't need to go very deep to, undefine, to identify them. What follows from this? There will be two parts to this presentation. First, will be about the state of, and the status quo of the Belarusian autocracy. Belarus is a highly personalized autocracy without a ruling party. Let's look at that in a comparative chart. It's a comparative chart, chart of democracies based on the how tough um, they are. So uh, Belarus is really a autocracy, a fully fledged one, according to the Economist Index of uh, intelligence units. You will be able to see that various countries being at different places. We'll leave it for later. Please uh, pay additional attention to this purple line. So Belarus is not at the top. It's not the most successful in terms of toughness. The toughest one is North Korea, as you may imagine. Not, the Belarus is still 34 points back. But it's ahead of Mauritius, Mali, at least by 34 points. Uh, so it's over the middle. So this process, at least in 2020, the beginning of 2021, before that, Belarus was a bit lower. So it wasn't that tough of an autocracy. Now, uh, Please note the personalization index of our autocracy. This is where the Belarus is. So the concentration of power in the hands of one person and the lack of desire to delegate the power to other institutes or institutions or people. So the concentration of power in one hand is very significant in Belarus. Belarus has 97 scores, North Korea has 99 points. As I said, that's all based on the economist index. The maximum score is 100. Another point, the significance of the ruling party. It's a structural thing that is important to understand. You, we do not see any purple line because it doesn't have a ruling party. We don't know whether it will ever appear in the future. But in majority of autocracies, there is one. And also it plays a significant part. There are autocracies with ruling parties like Azerbaijan, uh, based on the variety of democracy index, its meaning is insignificant. So Azerbaijan also has a zero point in this respect. And in Belarus, there is no ruling party. There are pro-government governmental parties, but they don't really take much, do not participate much in the decision-making process. What follows from this? 
there is a center of power is well identifiable. It's no wonder that uh, absolutist regimes of the course of history have made use of this. So this is doesn't happen very often these days. I mean the concentration of power. It's pretty particularly important for law enforcement agencies. They understand where the center of power is, who makes decisions or who controls this process. There are significant minuses though. The strong personalization decreases the quality of management. Also, there's absence of a rule absence of a ruling party, and this is an additional risk factor. At least what multiple cases show. We've been using this research as well. So absence of ruling party creates additional risk for the regime. What else? Regarding the state of the Belarusian autocracy, serious legitimization problems, toughening repression, repressions and cohesion of elites in question. In few more words about that. Here's a model used by us, the one by the German political scientist, three pillars of authoritarianism, legitimization, repression on cooptation, cooptation of the law enforcement, technocratic, economic elites. Three of these are kinds of elites are very significant. I mean, and three pillars of authoritarianism are significant as well. A few more words now about each of them. First comes legitimization, the index of the electoral process and pluralism of Belarus, based on the data from The Economist starting from 2006 until 2020. It has always been low, but in 2020, this parameter went down to zero. It's an expert evaluation. Legitimization means perception by the population and the elites. Here the, the situation is not very easy. First and foremost, we see an extremely low confidence in the Central Election Commission. It was obvious in the spring last year, 11% of confidence in the CC in Minsk based on the Na National Institute of Sociology. I don't really remember the, the figures now, but uh, we also witness a shrinking audience for the state media and low trust in them. In 2018, the trust in uh, state media was much bigger than, uh, stronger than that in the independent media. Now it's the other way around. You can see that based on the internet media outlets, and state media outlets, what the status quo is. Next comes the two obvious falsifications and rigging of 2020. They had uh, a lot of people seen that. Next, deficit of reliable opinion polls. This could have played in favor of the regime. The fact that so sociological centers, ind be it independent or governmental ones, It could have played in favor of the regime, but in 2020, it became a disadvantage for the regime. This uh, well-known meme, notorious meme of 
it has been used by many people as a metaphor, as a meme, but many people did believe that Lukashenko didn't have more than 3% of people supporting him. It means that there were no significant and uh, well-made sociological surveys. And this situation, this figure became a social factor. So background lack of confidence in COVID-19 statistics added to that. It was relevant in, back in 2019, in 20, 2020, and it's relevant now. That's as far as the the electoral legitimation is concerned. Other legitimation also exists, the economic one, the ideological one, and it's very controversial here, particularly if we talk about the social contract. The economic part is very questionable because the economic stagnation for a long time has been quite obvious. Now it's could end in depression. Well, the stealth enemy, the COVID, remains. Um, on the other hand, the fear of destabilization and chaos, so-called the maidenization, remains and remains strong and evokes some negative associations, not positive ones. The rhetoric of so-called uh, traditional values retains its potential. This is actively used by the regime, the Lukashenko's regime. And here, the Russian mass media and this message coming from Kremlin, they support this. Here we see some potential as well. As to the repression, there have been several research. I'm mentioning one of them by Daniel Treisman, based on 316 cases. It follows from it that the stiffening repressions are the, is the main cause of the collapse of 22% of autocracies. Here, we're dealing with the situations when We could say that that was a major reason, but there were additional reasons. There were additional factors that could weaken the autocracies. Well, the cost of repression of Bel in Belarus have been obvious in the past, such as Tikhanovsky's detention, torches of 9th to 11th of August, now we're witnessing large-scale detentions, such as liquidation of media, outlets, and NGOs. What will it lead to? We don't know. Nobody could say that it will be the major reason for the collapse, but it does create another risk factor for the stability of autocracy in Belarus, because the it's all building up, the risk of protests are very high and it could explode any minute. A few words about the elites. Lukashenko remains for the economic elites and the poly, for the law enforcement elites, a grantor and a judge. The there are created the internal conflicts between the agencies so that Lukashenko could be the judge in this. Lukashenko for many remains uh, remains the keeper of the status quo. Next comes the Russian socialization of the elites. The next slide will show more details on that. It is the fact that currently works in favor of regimes. The departure from the system for moral and professional reasons continues. I have people leaving the system. Another problem that we are facing is the 
alienation of the army. The army in Belarus is uh, the only one, or at least one of the many armies where the financial support of the law enforcement board is, is higher than that of allocated for the defense purposes. The situation that the military found themselves in at the se in the second half of this 2020 was also controversial. So it evoked feelings of discontent. The part two in, includes factors of transformation, the positive ones, the negative ones, and the ambivalent ones. The positive factors are as follows. Over the last decade, based on the European survey of values, this, the decrease in the level of paternalist growth of faith in one's own strength Answering the question, who the well-being of a person or individual should depend on the person himself or the state, we see that a lot of people saying that the role of the state is not that significant anymore. This comes to the increase in the level of education comes out from uh, the information received during the international indices, the strengthening of the middle class and the experience of the pro-democratic mobilization in 2020. That was unprecedented mobilization, not only in terms of the history of Belarus, not only history of the region, but also on the, based on the varieties of democracy index, this pro-democratic mobilization well, they received 3.93 out of four points. So it's almost a record one. It's comparable to pro-democratic mobilization in Venezuela in 2017. But here we can also recall the media media law of 3.5%. It is based on the interpretation of, of research by uh, Mr. Stepan and his colleague, which shows that the protest actions in favor of democracies involved over 3.5%. But is the case, then uh, during the year, the changes are inevitable. It was falsified by the Venezuelan case, and a week ago it was approved wrong by the Belarusian case. After a year, the protest movement has not achieved its main goals. But even without the uh, empirical uh, approach and data, it would be naive to say that a uh, single factor even such a powerful one like massive participation in the protest movement could lead to systemic changes. But together with other factors that uh, remain significant, they do exist. It doesn't mean that they should be, uh, changes would uh, be, come over within uh, six months, so a year or two, but these factors on, they lead to faster changes. I mean, to, uh, in the near future. What are the negative factors of transformation? Controversial, 
national identity or weak national identity of Belarusians. It's not that much about their identity. It's that uh, it is being compensated on a different level. Increased demand for national identity. Hankering for the, the Soviet past. Doesn't mean the Soviet past is very important and interesting for Belarusians, but this element of self-identification, the connect, connection to the Eurasian values uh, as opposed to the Western values plays a role. Th these are the things that negatively influence the process of transformation. The value based Euroscepticism of the Belarusians, low level of uh, the real integration of uh, the European Union. Next comes the low level of Belarusians involvement in the global economy. Next is the Russian socialization of the Belarusian elites. I'm sorry, I promised you this slide before, here it is. Based on the research by the Georgian political scientist Lebanidze, you see the balance between Belarusian, the number of Belarusian officials and Western ones and the Russian education, with the Russian education. Some, there is some potential risk, but based on the data before 2014, we can see the similar trend. We can see the prevalence of socialization of the Belarusian officials into the Russian environment. There are some ambivalent factors for, of transformation. First, it is the small social inequality in Belarus. In the countries where the social contrast is uh, high, it's much easier to mobilize people. In Belarus, the small social inequality is there. Next fact, uh, well, if there is a switch to democracy, the democracy is more stable. So this is a good point. Next comes the high state stability. The monopoly of the state, of the use of force and the violence, and a consensus regarding the state borders like a regional global changes towards democracy. These are favorable things that in future will play a positive role, while democracy will be building. But currently it's uh, we see that on the one hand, there's a state stability. On the other hand, we see a bigger potential to up suppress the opposition. Next comes the lack of regional global changes in terms of democracy and decentralized protest movement, of course. This has its pluses and minuses. So as I said, the global background plays a role here, like original re global changes towards democracy. The situation is different now compared to 1989, 1990. In the post-war, second post-war post period, or even after the First World War, where there were serious global changes, this contributed to the activization of uh, pro-democratic movement. Now, in the global sense, on the global scale, it's all quiet. 
there's a rollback or slowdown of the democratization, or at least the, on the global scale, the idea of democratization is not felt as much as it was in 1990. Next point is the growth of China's soft power. Why they're not negative? Because in the 1970s, 1980s, during the modernization, with no serious global shift, there were countries that were still getting more and more democratical, even though not so fast. The democracy there is more stable that in the in the, the countries that were getting democratized based on the wave of in conclusion procedural legitimacy at the measurement culture are the most vulnerable places of the regime on the other hand the russians euroscepticism and the russian socialization of elites are the vulnerable spots and places of protest leaders or this protest centers Another point is the global time of democracy has slowed down and this affects the pace of local transformation. But the demand for changes is going nowhere in Belarus. So it's the stable thing that remains in the Belarusian society. It doesn't mean, of course, that 80 or 90 or 97 percent support the change it's much less but at least 50 percent or more are expecting the changes on this and this or that to this and that degree not many people are ready to take serious risks for that but when the autocracy shows that it's not particularly sure of itself and or there, when there is a new trigger, the dominoes, domino effect may be witnessed. Well, that's basically all from me, except for the quote from Andres Kurko, who wrote on Facebook about a year ago. He wrote 26 years of tyranny was grown inside the body of people in every bone of it every blood vessel and you want to take it away within a couple of days without getting your hands dirty and without getting tired that's not going to happen that's what he wrote and i here i would like to end my presentation thank you very much Piotr. thank you very much for the comprehensive review and the presentation of your research now I would like to give our speakers to share their views regarding the results of the research presented by Piotr. And uh, I would like to ask our speakers, what are now the major pillars of the personal autocracy and what factors could contribute to its dismantling? Pavel Usov will speak first because he is in a hurry. Please, Pavel. Thank you, Vadim. <laughs> Thank you, colleagues, distinguished guests. Piotr, thank you for the presentation, for this work that you've done. This is very relevant, both in terms of polit political thought of Belarus and the international political science, because to some degree, the Belarusian authoritarianism If we consider the study of authoritarians over the last several decades, it's a unique case, not only because autocracy has existed in the center of Europe for the last almost 30 years, but because it was successfully resisting a serious systemic crisis that in other countries, in other cases, led to the collapse of authoritarianism. Indeed, today, I believe that the Belarusian authoritarian system and the processes that uh, we are witnessing now inside 
the country and around it they uh, present and will present an interesting case for research and probably will give to many researchers an answer why autocracies can be so stable. I would give a very high mark to this analysis and for many of those who are still have, have illusions about Belarus having a, an easy and fast transit of power. This is a cold shower for them. However, we may discuss the stability of the future of uh, Belarusian authoritarianism, possible transit of power. And here I fully agree with Pyotr saying that the uh, leave of the authoritarian lead, leader doesn't always uh, mean a transformation towards the democratization of the system. And it has to do with a big number of factors. To understand which of them are key for the future of Belarus and the future democracy in Belarus, I would like to give you a quote of one of the famous researchers of the geopolitics and uh, totalitarian authoritarian regimes, Mr. Brzezinski who has been studying totalitarian regimes. And basically he introduced this term. Well, he said the only thing that unites and dictatorships is the absence of choice. So the absence of choice shows that all dictatorships are similar, but in terms of transportation, leadership, sustainability, they're all different due to the internal political culture and based on the historical development factors and uh, they're also different if we talk about the uh, transformation processes. We could remember the famous work the th called the third wave of democratization by Mr. Huntington and they are different by their geopolitical surroundings in countries like Belarus, which is in a very difficult political environment, particularly if we consider the geopolitical changes and the political split. If we consider the beginning of the 1990s and the changes in the Central and Eastern Europe, we would understand that they were based on the internal collapse of the Soviet Union that basically initiated the, the change and the shift to the socialism with a human face. If we look at the Latin American countries where at the beginning of 1980s in Chile and other countries there was a political transformation and it had to do with a general change the global status quo, the, the end of the Cold War, which led to the United States um, that stopped fighting with authoritarian regimes. Mr. Roosevelt once said about some also data from Latin America. So he said that the uh, this is a, he's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. Unfortunately, this formula works towards Belarus. What, uh, but if we look at the influence of Russia, Russia remains the key factor of stability of the Belarusian authoritarian regime, which was uh, confirmed by uh, almost directly by Mr. Putin at the meeting uh, with Angela Merkel not so long ago. Well, he said that the problems of Belarus remain internal ones. Well, he never said uh, internal problems of whom, because Belarus is currently seen by, uh, as an internal problem of Russia by many. And indeed, the influence of the Russian factor has a key influence on that. And the Russian factor played a uh, a very important role 
because the electoral support of Lukashenko was diluted, particularly when the crisis was building up and the new leadership was forming. It was clear that Putin decided to get rid of Lukashenko. Uh, Babarika appeared, Mr. Tepkala came to the fore, and Mr. as well as Mr. Tikhanovsky. They showed uh, the transformation process could be supported by Russia that mobilized the part of the Russian election, uh, electoral electorate. But if we talk about the factors who could contribute to the destruction of the authoritarian regime, authoritarian system in Belarus, first and foremost, we should name the stable civil society. Unfortunately, currently it's under the total and full-scale pressure. On the one hand is the factor of transformation, on the other hand, the suppression and oppression of the civil society is one of the factors contributed to, to the stability of a regime. Because currently we witness uh, many people that actually participated in this fight with the system, uh, they're leaving the, the country. And this leads to the Belarusian regime getting more stable. And we see that the mass repressions, similar to those uh, in the Hitler's Germany and uh, the Soviet Union, now it's replaced with the people getting kicked out. But this way or the other, the physical uh, influence on the regime leads to the changes. And today we look at the objective of the situation in Belarus. This is not so easy to achieve. Also, we talk about the chain, uh, the reasons that led to the crisis in the country in 2020. One of the key ones here, I would not agree that it was COVID-19 or some other things like lack of trust to mass media outlets. I think one of the key factors of this explosion was the erosion of the political leadership. So inadequacy of Lukashenko's reactions to the problems arising in Belarus and the decision-making with the um, mistakes. Piotr did not mention this, but the report has a link uh, uh, to the information that a number of mistakes led to the, some processes, like the reaction of Lukashenko to COVID-19, his bad attitude to the people who uh, were down with illness or dead, absence of the support to the people who uh, suffered from the COVID aftermath, he a number of times said that he will not allocate money for that. But his uh, absolutely shameful uh, behavior, non-leadership behavior, even though he has been many times called uh, the leader, the father of the nation, the Batska, the change in the image was due to his inadequate reaction and erosion of his leadership over the last several years, at least three years. Particularly, it was obvious during the, the previous, the last parliamentary campaign when the Maria Vasilevich became the MP. And now it's called the Sultanization of the regime. Those of you interested in this, uh, please read the Juan Linsen Stepan classification, who said that authoritarian leader turns into a sultan. And we look at the 
his surroundings, people surrounding him. Uh, you will see the beautiful Maria Vasilievich appearing in the parliament, the protocol service, so he's uh, actively surrounded by the beautiful women. He reminds of an old sultan. His election campaign showed a um, lack of desire to actively participate in political process. And he showed that uh, he was actually relying on the system. If we look at his latest address, which lasted eight hours, that was an attempt to renew his, uh, revitalize his role, to stop the erosion of his leadership, to reinstate his charisma, attractiveness, even though it's a uh, a late move and probably they will not they will not have a long-term effect for the system because the leadership erosion is added with uh, with problems with his health it was also obvious after his address and the future of this personalized regime in belarus will depend on the psychological and physical state of Lukashenko, on how much he will be able to hold the system in his hands and get a grip on the system, whether we will be able to prevent the erosion of his leadership, not to put off the people surrounding him now, and the weakening of his leadership role could lead to the process inside the system. This will lead to the fight for the power and we'll be connected with the Lukashenko getting more tired and old. We could expect two scenarios here, whether it was Uzbekistan scenario or the Azerbaijan scenario. It hasn't been mentioned here yet. This transit uh, in, inside one clan could happen in Belarus. It's difficult to say whether it will happen but Lukashenko is not given up on it yet. This can provoke sustainability and stability. Well, in the re re survey, we heard of a black swan factor. The, for the regime, it was the coronavirus. On the other hand, it could be a white swan if the thought is reacted to it in an adequate way. In many ways, Lukashenko will look at the, uh, at the evolution of the system. Uh, Lukashenko was helped uh, by the white ones. Terror acts in New York, 2001. Everybody forgot about the election in Belarus. Situation after 2010, when the system was in isolation, even though it was a crisis, not as bad as in 2020, but the war in Ukraine defroze the relationship with Lukashenko and allowed the system to get a new level, both economically and politically, in its relationship with the West. Unfortunately, we are not, we still may get and witness the white ones that could stabilize the, uh, the Lukashenko's power. One of them, recent ones, was the Taliban in Afghanistan, depending on the situation there. We'll see how much the attention of the international community will be attached to Belarus, how much pressure there will be on Belarus. We'll see, we saw that in May, due to the new wave of COVID and uh, poison, poison of Navalny and him getting back to Moscow, him getting arrested and uh, sentenced, and a number of other factors led to that. If not, uh, 
But for the stupid and theoretic decisions of Lukashenko, uh, like uh, the incident with the Ryanair plane, we could have been uh, witnesses to a different situation. But those white swans still there, and Lukashenko still reacting uh, inadequately due to his psychological state and his own perception of reality. We could also talk about the influence of Russia here, but uh, the fact of the blue white swan should not be excluded. As to the prospects in the near future, I believe that in the near in the next couple of years, we should not expect any radical changes in the system. The major break for the democratic transfer will be Russia. In the strategic plane, there will be some Russian military bases that could lead to the lack of democratization of Belarus for the many years to come. There was a separate research on law enforcement. And it's not the officials that can determine or will determine the stability of democratization, but the army that in many ways is Russified and the key position there, starting from the head of uh, Mr. Vaikovic, who was born in Russia, in Kazan, who is Russian, and uh, who is vivid representative of the Russian world in Belarus, and uh, ending with uh, key positions like in the general staff, and Mr. Hrenin, who is the defense minister. They're all connected with Russia and the Russian world. They have the Russian doctrine in their mind. Mm. So in many countries where changes took place, this could uh, lead to the situation where without sovereignty, stable democratization will not happen. Thank you, Pavel, for this analysis. Uh, listening to uh, the explanation using the black and white swan, I thought maybe we should next time invite ornithologists, but I particularly liked your point about the coronavirus and its role that it plays in the current situation. Usually Lukashenko used to cope with it easily. Well, I think Lukashenko was busy playing hockey here. Fine. Now I'd like to uh, give forward to Vitaly Zyganov. Could you please share your views on the research presented by Piotr and on the, the, st the regime stability factors? What are they now and how they can be influenced in the future? Unfortunately, the speaker is muted. I should, it's fine now. Thank you, Vadim. I think I need about five, seven minutes. My remark. Can you hear me well? Okay. Now I'd like to share with you some of the remarks that I have. I read the text of the survey and I liked it a lot. For my articles, for my remarks, I uh, made some notes. 
that uh, could be argued over, could be developed. One of the best that I liked is the point that uh, in social political reality there are no laws. It's good that, that the authors of this research understand this because an expert is a person who makes forecasts and then tries to understand, to explain why they never came true. In this regard, Pyotr said that in Belarus, like in any country, it is a unique case. I think Huntington used to write about different countries that uh, there is a unique country like Haiti. I think uh, when I was in Moldova several years ago, I thought that they are even more unique than us in terms of the number of the problems they face and the solutions, potential solutions. So we shouldn't really think that we are the most mysterious country in the world, but it's worth saying that the Boston case is quite original and uh, unique. Also, I like the fact that I like what you said about the ruling party. It's one of the things that I uh, suspected about, but at the political level, I saw that the ruling party is a more powerful construct for authoritarian regime and it increases his chances for survival. But based on the statistics and the previous examples, we see that Lukashenko doesn't want to have one. I don't think he doesn't understand that he would be able to support his position and his strengthen his position. It's just he doesn't uh, feel that it's right for him. He and maybe understands that the ruling party, anyone but even a weak one, could hinder him. And he even weakens the ruling party because he hasn't been trying to make one. It is one of the factors uh, which shows that authoritarianism so this is the first situation uh, where his psychological views of Lukashenko they undermine his chances for survival I mean the the political one. From the journalist's point of view, I noticed that I noticed the graph number 28 was significant. It says that uh, the change of regime could be intentional, non-planned one, and by mistake. So the intentional 23%, non-planned one, three, and by mistake was 74%. I uh, was surprised why Petr Rutkowski didn't say here that all in God's hands, considering his background, because 74% is a significant figure. I mean, when the changes are due to mistakes, and we just need to hope for these mistakes. But it does happen. It doesn't guarantee that uh, one, two or three mistakes lead to changes. But it became a widespread um, argument by a, a person, political scientist like Schreiber and others who say that the regime will make mistake, mistakes and this will lead to their collapse. What happens if it doesn't make mistake? Well, nobody knows, but 74% say that it's a, a significant option. Next, mm, the passage about the repression, the scale and the necessity has a phrase that It says that in the short, uh, middle term perspective and short term perspective, the authorities need to tune down, slow down repression and uh, make concessions. Well, this looks 
convincing. But the question is why do they, why not have the same level of repression, not uh, increase them radically, but uh, because there's a lack of space and, and prisons, of course. Many analysts said quite a long time ago that at some point uh, the authorities will have to stop repression. But uh, except maybe the last several weeks, there were contradictory. There were some people were released from prison. The repression is not stopping. So we shouldn't say that they stop very soon. This point was a short one, but uh, it uh, should be discussed further. Whether mm, these concessions will lead to changes and whether they are necessary. Well, next, maybe not the hardest topic in August when we celebrate the anniversary of the beginning of the protest. This is the difference between the peaceful, non peaceful protests, various political scientists and journalists. charismatically discuss the peaceful protest and they give figures about the peaceful protest having more chance to lead to change. But we're talking about the concrete case of Belarus, concrete Belarusian protest, when we should uh, see that the active part of the population is showing the non lack of satisfaction, non satisfaction with the, this approach. People are not satisfied with the results that a peaceful protest led to. They begin to discuss an alternative, but not many people want to experience it. That's the major problem. Here, I would say that uh, violent actions would be more effective if uh, there would be 20, 30 people making a uh, palace uh, revolution, like I would say, a palace revolution. Over I have people who once said that why not people among uh, those among the law enforcement did not make this step of you know arresting several individuals, thus solving the issue. So this violent approach would be more effective than the months of peaceful protests. And this is not a reproach. This is a discussion about whether theoretical approaches could lead to practical results. I was interested to uh, read about the national identity in the survey, and it's been quite weak, 54%, according to NOVA, Other researchers say 98% is important. So it could be replaced with sub national. And uh, that above national, which was always either European world or the Russian world. The fact that we have the quality of skepticism, according to the survey. Is a paradoxical, paradoxical thing. 
it's based on the effects of the post-Soviet period. We know that at some point, uh, at the beginning of 2000s, more people supported the integration with the Europe than integration with Russia. But literally, over the last five, seven years, this has changed. in the sense that Crimea and Vance played a role there. Russia is viewed differently. On the other hand, Belarusians saw the changes in Europe, like the migrant crisis and the problems of the gay marriage, which for many Belarusians is not acceptable at all. So Belarusians are not happy with the European values for those reasons. For me, it's a sad and uh, showing phenomenon when the pro-European chose uh, is uh, going down as we are uh, moving further away from the collapse of the Soviet Union. And this shows that not all processes are moving in a single direction towards the European Union, and that this process can have uh, changes in them that are uh, based not by strategic reasons. I mean, the, nothing really collapsed in Europe. Democracy no, never stopped there. But those are such a no way, shy away, shy away from uh, the European choice. The authoritarianism that Belarus is having shows that in the political scientist, in political life, sometimes the experts say that that Belarusians will not become true Belarusians until they you know, learn how to sing the. Bautne Boja, powerful God, anthem in Belarus, that we did not deserve the changes until the people who go to the protest do not speak Belarusian. On the other hand, there are analysts, sociologists who claim that in Belarus there is no, there are no pro-liberal views and pro-European views. Belarusians still share archaic views and we don't deserve changes. Which means that Belarusians have not, you know, have not deserved the changes. I think this, the, the idea of the extremes is not relevant because Belarusians, I believe, have outgrown the non-legitimate authorities that uh, Belarusians have. And uh, what happens after the authorities leave will be a political life. Some say that when Lukashenko leaves, there will be a pro-Russian fraction. But I ask those people, what, do you, what would you want to be? There might as well be the pro-Russian fraction in the parliament. Why not? Because then population supports it. We need to understand that uh, it is very much possible. We need to understand why. There could be a radical fraction. It could be a pro-European, pro-Russian fraction. This will all be a part of the political life. I'm saying this just to prove that the major political uh, aim would be, should be not the formation of the ideal population, but the change of the authorities, change of the regime. This would, would lead to a normal political life that would lead to a new population, new people, 
In one of my articles, uh, I uh, wrote about extensively about this. I wrote that a lot will be, well, basically everything will change after the Lukashenko leaves. At the beginning of the survey, there was a phrase that we cannot analyze, but we need to give some ethical uh, foundation for Belarusians. That will help the participants of the process to actively, effectively use their forces. So here I would like to say that the aim to goal of changing authorities, changing power, is more important than to build in the ideal mood, civic mood. Thank you. Thank you, Vitaly. I really like your conclusion. Many people got so inspired by the changes in the 2010, 20, that they believe that all the problems will be solved in, in a moment. There will be ideal Belarusians, ideal economy, ideal political life, and so on. But that's not possible. And the task is more complicated than our aims towards the ideal. Okay, now, but last but not least, I'd like to give word to Lesia Rudnik. Lesia, what do you think about uh, the presentation by Piotr and about the reflections by other experts? What do you think will contribute to the further transformation? Thank you, Vadim. I would like to try to be brief, not touch uh, the arguments mentioned by other speakers. First, I would like to say that's a great piece of research because uh, the Belarusian space, like the global analysis that would use the political theory in a scale that Piotr used. So thank you, Piotr, for this comprehensive approach. Thank you for the text. Hopefully it will be published soon. Everyone else present here will be able to read it because indeed, it will be very interesting. Now I would like to briefly share with you my reflections. First, about the legitimization. legitimization. During the presentation, we saw a scheme and a lot, has, a lot of time was dedicated to that uh, in this survey. It says that legitimation is one of the foundations of uh, democracy. There are different kinds of legitimacy by Weber and so on, also analyzed in the paper. I believe it's very important when we analyze but uh, I uh, wanted to get more understanding with uh, resources will be analyzed because we always say that autocracy has legitimation and it's one of its foundations. But at the same time, we're forgetting that foundations of the autocracy could be analyzed through different approaches and angles. One of the angles that came to my mind is the theory of resource mobilization. In other words, it's the analysis of the resources that regime possesses. I think it could uh, involve both material, non-material resources and other foundations. If we look at the situation in Belarus, based on this approach, we will see that for Belarus, it's very, it matches the Belarusian approach. Because when uh, not many people believe Lukashenko to be legitimate, this foundation of legitimacy becomes less and less relative. So the material and non-material resources, tangible and tangible resources will become more and more relevant. If we look at the theories of resource mobilization, we can try to 
understand what foundations are more relevant for Belarus now, more powerful. This uh, way we see that the Belarusian case, the technology and high tech has become one of the resources that mobilize the protesting mood. It was dominating there, but was absent in the regime. It's very important because in the countries that are representing other kinds of authoritarian regimes like China, technology is always is also used as a very important mobilizing tool of the regime, which very often creates a foundation for the stability of the regime. So I believe that uh, in the Belarusian case, the dominance of the resources and the use of technology by protesters is something that should be paid more attention to, and that that is something I lack in this research. So the use of the social networks, social feeds, the internet, what Compared to the Arab Spring, when uh, Twitter played a major role, Viber, YouTube, the Telegram played a bigger role here. However, analyzing the situation from the point of view of resources is important and not forgetting the role of technology. Piotr said that the social contract is collapsing now due to the fact that regime cannot provide for the economic development of the country. But I believe that in Belarusian case, it's not only about the economy. I think the social contract is broken due to the safety and security problems. One of the points of the social contract is the safety and security. Uh, in exchange of loyalty. So the lack of the physical uh, safety and security for people now leads to the crisis of the social contract in the country. Therefore, I believe we are talking here not solely about the economic factors, but also about the security, which we've heard a lot about in the beginning of the protest became the key one. Many, the state representatives and uh, independent observers and show that the people were given up on that on the importance of the social contract contract due to the lack of safety and security. Well, my next point is that various patterns that democratization of the authoritarian regime has I believe here it's very important to remember that there are various authoritarian regimes. When we look at the statistics, the biggest data set analyzed in terms of authoritarian regimes. It's very important to find uh, examples similar to Belarus. And the difference, specifics, specificity of the Belarusian case are obvious. Here, I believe it's very important for the social scientists to understand that there's a new typology of authoritarian regimes that is arising. They may uh, be a part of the old classifications, but they receive new features. A good example here would be China, which from the one hand uh, is based on the ideological legitimacy 
mentioned by Piotr as well in his research. And also some research is classified as the, the networking authoritarianism. In other words, it is an authoritarianism that uses technology, social networks, and internet censorship, not just to suppress those who disagree with the political course of the regime, but also for the open propaganda and competition. These types of authoritarian regimes could fall into the existing classifications, but also have new features that uh, affect the foundations, weak factors, weakening factors, and others that we are discussing these days. Also, in, an important fact that I remember from the paper, like the a lack of clear I ideology of the protesters, or the weak ideology of the protest, protest. And I think that this, the weak ideology protest, protest, is very much about the pro-governmental supporters. It's very much about the people who cannot formulate or find their ideology because it's diluted, it's not concrete enough. And they don't have this unity, they don't have these symbols, they don't have uh, the leaders that keep to the image, because we know that Lukashenko often makes mistakes in his actions, in his rhetoric, and these mistakes affect the supporters of his regime. I believe that the problem of uh, non-linearity of this political support of this stance is something that characterizes the supporters of Lukashenko. While other research created by, made by Chatham House and other search houses, the protesters, irrespective of the leaders that they support, have similar ideologies. We also know about the unity of the symbols. We see the certain depolitization we see an advert process, the opposite process. It was positive last year, but now people who stayed in the country became more and become more and more depoliticized. It could be called a external depolitization, but despite it all, people who support the protest even though we're not, not participating in it, actively in it, they do have a certain ideology and unity demonstrated uh, and supported by various research. Recalling the Chinese example in similar countries, we may say that there's a difference between them and others in the sense that they are trying to keep in the country using their propaganda you know, the media middle class like IT specialists economists intellectuals businessmen people like those in case of countries like China remain in the country because for them uh, special conditions are made they are safe secure, therefore depolitization of the state is visible, but they share the powerful ideology and allows them to keep, make choice in favor of staying inside the country. In case of Belarus, we say that IT specialists and other organizations of the middle class are leaving the ship, abandoning the ship. So, because they don't, there's no guarantees of social contract, 
terms of security safety and there's no powerful ideological base that will affect the supporters of the protests we witness this brain drain an important thing here is that uh, in the paper you spoke about this world values survey shown that the belarusians want to have a powerful authorities it is actually supported by the recent wave of the uh, people survey in other words Belarusians are saying that it's important for them to have the powerful leader so here i believe in the situation when the the people strive for equality a just political process and at the same time they want a powerful leader this is a contradictory thing what democratic forces may do now is uh, try to convince the other people that they require decentralization and that the powerful political leader not necessarily solves all the problems that exist in the new society and in a new state which appears after the collapse of the autocracy i think this point is very important well i'm uh, nearing the end of my presentation peter also mentioned that without the political parties the 30s have uh, have it better but in a authoritarian system there will there's usually a ruling party that helps to make the authorities and the regime more stable i think that this is too far-fetched this look may look far-fetched but until there is a no space for political ruling party in belarus we may hope that the regime will collapse sooner and will make the mistake very often mentioned by the belarusian experts and analysts and that this mistake will be a decided one overall i believe that the to build a democratic system in the country will require stability which means uh, the civil society development communication with the population i think it will lack educational component which could be the something promoting the stability of the system in the future yes it has been mentioned for a dec dec decade or even longer by various civil initiatives but it is in this crisis moment continuing education of the society and communication with society is great is very important we need to explain to people why it's important to risk in such situation when there is a move towards a, a switch towards a different model for the stability it's important to deconstruct the regime of lukashenko to understand that it's based not only on legitimacy and repression but also on some other resources that i think pavel mentioned at the very beginning a more systemic approach means that the academic community needs to have a more stance on that going back to the last point of Pyotr, that the need or demand for change is not going away we see there's a, a there's a external depolitization that we're witnessing in belarus or reverse depolitization we have a return to 2020 in status quo here i believe the demand for change that are not articulated 
through various initiatives, unfortunately, will not lead to changes. At, on, on this pessimistic note, I would like to thank once again Piotr for this research, and I hope that uh, soon we'll be able to read the final version of it. I'd like to thank all the participants of this discussion. Thank you, Lesia, for this remark. Going back to the contradiction between the powerful leader and the democratic approach, I must say that I believe that's not so contradictory if we look at the examples of protest, protest uh, in Belarus when people were acting in the decentralized way. But at the same time, we saw that people understood the powerful leadership will exist until the people will allow it to exist. Compared to the Middle Ages and the Novgorod, and the princes who were important both, both in the vicinity and in Moscow. Right, so not going back in history too much, I would like to ask Anton to review the questions that we received during the registration and those that we already have. I would like to ask the participants of our discussion. to raise their hands or write in the chat their questions so that we would see them. And I also would like to ask to Anton to read out the questions so the Peter will be able to react to their questions, to their opinions, ideas. I came from our speakers. Anton, do we have the question on the list? I mean, I think Yuri Dekahust wanted to say something. Well, actually, I'm looking at the questions that are not particularly relevant to the to our discussion. Well, you, until we find something interesting, you can use the Dekahrust, the floor is yours. Hello and welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, great. I just wanted to clarify something regarding what Alesia said. I mean, the strive of Belarusians for the future. I would call it the strive for the powerful authorities. Using the example of Afghanistan, we see the authorities, the democratic authorities given by the people, collapsed just like sand. I think many Belarusians, they uh, favor not the strong hand, but the firm, effective authorities that is not collapsing not falling apart. I think the whole generation remembers that uh, in 1990s, Stanislav Shushkevich, well respected by us, said, I don't have powers. And the people said, then we will elect the person who will be able to have the powers. Uh, Belarusians are striving for that. It's different to what we're saying about now. The democratic power authorities could be powerful in this way. And uh, we need to talk about that separately and tell people that the democracy is 
is not like in Afghanistan, or it may not be like in Afghanistan. We need to reflect and understand what are the preconditions to what happens after Lukashenko. If what we have uh, will be similar to Afghanistan said that everybody will disperse and there will be 300,000 people with arms. It's not something I want. Supporters of the change formulate the strive for change in the following way. Yes, we are in favor of change, but it's not like uh, given powers like they did in Afghanistan. Thank you, Yuri. Well, in the past, the uh, authorities said, do you want it to have it like in Ukraine? So now we should change it to Ukraine for Afghanistan. In Belarus, we want to have authorities that will not turn off hot water in Nova Bravaya district and uh, the infrastructure will not collapse. This is a sane demand. Thank you, Yuri. Like I promised, I would like to give floor to Piotr to react to what was said about his research. Could you also say to us when it will be available for wider audience? Piotr? During the preparation of the of the text of the research, we knew that it will be uh, available tomorrow in a in a bridged format, and by the end of the week, it will be fully available. I left in the chat the link to our website. This research will be available there. Some speakers will have already referred to the research, but I think majority, the majority of the participants have not seen it. Well, the fact that we are discussing it now is a good, it sure is a, I would like to thank all the people who have made remarks about uh, my work. I'm not going to use time to comment on them in detail. In many ways, those were commentary remarks. I mean, the remarks that uh, added something, some angle to it. It was interesting to see the situation from a different angle. Well, I'd like to comment some points, comment on some points that I heard regarding the mistakes, the fact that the experts have been re referring to this category of mistakes. Vital Siganko uh, mentioned that as a coordinator and an editor of the research, I did my best not to focus too much on this side, even though it's there in the Daniel Prisman's, Trisman's research. Uh, but I, I just simply don't like this approach. I don't think this is scientifically based. The state and mistakes mean that we know about the alternatives. An alternative course of events. Like if the autocrats didn't do that, then there would be this. But we don't know any alternative uh, approach, any alternative events. We, it's not that 
he was drawn is just that uh, the mistakes, not about the mistakes made by autocrats, is just the aftermath of this so that action cannot be forecast by, by more than 30 slash 50 percent and this here is a more scientific uh, approach well the research by Trisman is remains relevant without having an opportunity to forecast all the consequences of all the actions there are appear categories of the autocracy collapsing due to unforeseen events in 22 percent of the cases we could say that due to the excessive repression we saw the collapse of this or that but but this can only be seen retrospectively retrospectively while making decisions autocrats cannot foresee this many have uh, the political intuition very well developed but still let's mention the resource the resources and the importance of the social feeds. My research will have more than 100 pages and not all relevant points could, could have been uh, included in my today's presentation. There will be a separate or several texts. They'll be connected to this research But it'd be, it will be better to make or write separate uh, texts on various topics, particularly the communication component and the role of the social feeds. Particularly, if those who want to compare China and Belarus should uh, very much do that. As I said, this is, where it is a major research, but there will be a s several separate pieces of research. I think they will appear in uh, September. Les mentioned, as well as Mr. Draka, Yuri Dragahrust, they said that of the last decade, among other things, there we witnessed the growth of number of participants of firm hand and the authorities, and the num number of people who are not against uh, the military playing more uh, major role who want to have uh, the military dictatorship. Here's a number of points that uh, come into play. Reaction to Maidan, to Ukrainian events. Not the events as such, but the events that were perceived through the prism of uh, the Belarusian media space. the state media of Russia and Belarus, because in, in the past, Belarusian media used to be more powerful than uh, they have been over the last 18 months. However, we see here a demand for effective authorities. This is a very important factor of Viktor Babarika's popularity, despite the fact that he has been in in prison for over a year. He's still very popular. Many people like him, according to the Cheddar Mouse. Many people see him as a future president of Belarus, as a symbol of an effective authorities. 
to the nearest category mentioned by Belarusians during the survey was this powerful authorities. I think I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Piotr. Since we have uh, touched upon the demand for the military authorities, We should maybe think of it as the potential demand for military overthrow. Maybe this uh, demand for a total military coup, army coup. Many people, maybe some people want the not the police to have more power, but the military. I don't think you, we have a question about the, the third is relying more on law enforcement and what to do with that. Indeed, the question from Mr. Flowers, what strategy would you recommend for the uh, moving the big number of representatives of the KGB and law enforcement into the a new role, do you think we should uh, provide amnesty for them or provide a different role to them? Thank you, Mr. Flowers, for this question. Indeed, if we, if we speak about the backbone of the regime, the law enforcement, has been its major support. Even though there were there have been a lot of appeals to the law enforcement officials to uh, disregard the orders and disobey the current authorities. But since what we have now is not what we wanted to achieve, means that uh, those appeals uh, were turned over. So what about the pillars? What can be done with this, the pillars that the regime has? I don't know who wants to start. Some of the speakers have left. Piotr Vitali Lisek, could you add anything to that? Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the solidarity with the others and Ukrainians regarding the law enforcement agencies. There is no collective responsibility that we see uh, so we can establish the guilt and uh, pass the punishment how important it is, is this today there's no preconditions now to forecast any revolt a mutiny against the authorities. Of course, some people are unhappy with, displeased with what is happening, but the still have a key, the, the military uh, need to something to rely on, the stability factor. And here the Russia plays an important role because Belarusian officials are very much connected with their Russian colleagues and counterparts and the behavior of the Kremlin, particularly for the law enforcement agencies, is a very important. I'm not saying it's a key one. I don't want to say the role of Russia is too big here. 
don't want to overstate it, but among the Russian elite, there are different approaches of views on the Russian issue, or well, the Belarus, the Belarusian issue. In the corridors, uh, the sidelines of the official meetings, different approaches have discussed. Still, we may say that the, the Kremlin remains loyal to the Belarusian regime, and there's a big chance that the Siloviki law enforcement agencies including the interior ministry staff will probably not challenge the autocracy. Alisa Vitali, who wants to add something? Alisa, please, I don't see Vitali. What do you think about this pillar? I will not add too much to this because it's the field and the arguments about the seal of the key is still under research. It's different, it's difficult to uh, give advice regarding this or without additional information. And the theory is that the Siloviki are controlled by the Viktor Lukashenko, somebody else. Uh, this remains a mystery for me, so it's difficult for me to add something to what has been said already. Well, it's difficult not to agree to what you say because we lack extended research in this area. But in interviews with the representatives of this block, we don't have too much time remaining, so I would like to ask Anton if there are people in the chat who would like to ask questions or raise hands or give a commentary. If there are some, please raise your hands. Um, if you want to add something. If not, I think we can conclude our meeting. Mr. Alan Flowers has raised his hand. I think uh, we have just read the question. So Alan, please, if you have a question. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, speaking from the United Kingdom, it's a conclusion that you can make that we have not, we, um, the opposition that is seeking regime change, has neither necessarily won the argument with our political forces, and I'm talking about the UK government in particular, um, has not won the argument, A, that there even should be an independent Belarus, and, and, and B, um, that taking financial pain, that is to say applying um, very heavy sanctions and applying them earlier, um, was an appropriate action. Um, now, I, I reference in this respect, some might be shocked by this argument, we've not won the argument even for working to retain an independent Belarus, there's no less a senior British Foreign Office official, Sir Roderick Lyon, who's a past um, British ambassador, and actually was the senior civil servant advising on Russian Eastern Europe when the Soviet Union fell. Um, he actually personally, about 10 years ago, was discussing with me, you know, why do we have an independent Belarus? Now, I'm not convinced it's fully recognized the extent to which these arguments have not been won in all capitals. And that's one reason for the delay in actions. Um, I would welcome comments from the speakers if A, they recognize this analysis, and B, if so, what to do about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, 
Thank you, Alan. So maybe our speakers could react to this. Piotr Lysia, Vitaly. Maybe you could answer the, uh, Alan's questions. And Uh, you mean uh, whether sanctions apply? Sanctions are applied uh, properly, uh, taking into account that they may have impact on Belarus independence. Um, no, no, not quite. There are two parts to this. What one is um, the, the 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 issue of. Um, the international community working to save and keep an independent Belarus. That in the UK, that argument is not a given, and it may not be realized, and I believe in other capitals also, that, that, that advisors speaking to heads of government um, are not all fully um, recognizing that a Belarus just absorbed by, by Russia wouldn't be a a, a better thing in the end. And secondly, regarding the sanctions, what the argument, um, should countries take the economic pain? Uh, is it worth it? And um, that, that argument, I don't believe, has been, what it certainly was not one for many, many months. Just, just, just look at the history of the delay and obfuscation, particularly by the British government, over what we could call effective sanctions. There, there seems to be a lack of understanding that there is a, a much more powerful arguments need to be deployed in favor of this. In other words, uh, um, short-term pain for long-term gain. I don't believe that there's been a convincing enough argument presented um, to the Western governments that they should take short-term pain for long-term gain because I don't believe they believe in or see the long-term game. And by the way, comments like this regime is going to go on for at least another two, three years, <laughs> that certainly doesn't help. Uh, the Western governments need scenarios presented to them that actually say, well, if you do the following, um, we, 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 we can analyze and believe that there is good reason for change. Uh, they're looking for change maybe in a six to 12 month period. So it, it's actually about the mentality and attitude of Western governments I'm asking the question about. And the question therefore is, do the panelists recognize um, that, that that exists? And if so, what to do about changing that attitude uh, towards dealings with Belarus? Well, uh, speaking of mentalities, uh, somewhat difficult, especially of such huge uh, entities like uh, like uh, the western europe or united kingdom well uh, of course there are there are a lot of ethical issues uh, concerning uh, sanctions uh, the consequences well and uh, frankly speaking speaking uh, well at, at 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 present we reduced the the part about san sanctions to a minimum uh, well, because, uh, well, it's it's really ambivalent issue. Uh, well, probably deserving uh, separate analysis. Uh, well, however, well, we have to recognize that, well, autocrats uh, can only react to incentives, to negative or positive incentives. And uh, sanctions, especially, well, economic sanctions, are quite uh, quite important incentives that can somehow influence uh, well maybe not behavior but at least the way of thinking of uh, autocrats so this is of course a quite ambivalent instrument but without applying it what other international instruments are well just preaching uh, preaching uh, good manners, good values, uh, high values. Well, it doesn't work with uh, autocrats. So, well, however ambivalent this instrument is, probably, at least in some cases, it is justified.
Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Piotr. Since we're running out of time, it would be great to hear some uh, final remarks from Vitaly and Lisa. Be somebody would uh, say a few words about the research as well. So what do you think is the most relevant? Now and we start with Lisa. Right, so uh, I believe that, again, it's very important that finally there's a, such a comprehensive and deep research using political knowledge, political theories based on the political foundation. So uh, I look forward to reading it. Uh, in full. It's important to use political theory more and to use it to show the practical side things, things like social feeds, various resources, pillars could be seen from different angles. It's important to present it, uh, consider it in your research. At the same time, researchers um, show different angles on the leadership and management uh, and so on. And we hope that in Belarus, this data will be available so that we'll be able to make such research, to conduct such research in the future. In the future. So overall, I agree with what Vitaly said, with uh, Pavel, and I think in the prospects in Belarus should be linked to the effective use of resources. One of the resources that belongs to the democratic forces is time. And the time should be used to build a sustainable practices, sustainable society, etc. At the same time, leaders may use it to reinforce the sustainability. And uh, not help the old authoritarian system create, turn into a new authoritarian system. So we have time, we need to use it properly. And not to expect any mistakes from the part of the regime, on the part of the regime. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Vitaly, please. The research, despite the fact that Piotr said there were some compliments, uh, I must say that uh, this is a very important survey, very important work, very needed one. It needs to become a Bible for those in political science. Why? Because in Bible, everyone can find something for them, something for pessimism, for optimism, for peace, for war. They could find uh, relevant quotations and uh, cases. Indeed, for the same is true about this research paper. One can find something there for optimism, for pessimism, for getting more active or sit down and waiting for the enemy to pass you on the river. I'm, I've, I've not come across anything in those in political science. At the end, there are some words by Mrs. Truco that nothing happens instantly. I remember in August, September last year, I uh, did not make any non-cautious non remarks. I said that our struggle is not a sprint, it's a marathon. 
Uh, some people said that uh, in uh, October 2020, there will be no longer Lukashenko. I just said that this is a marathon. For marathon, you need theoretical foundation. I think the, our research gives such foundation. Thank you, Vitaly. Peter, what do you think about the, uh, your work compared with Bible? Well, it's, I don't think really uh, has anything to do with the Bible, but I really like the comparison. Thank you very much for your remarks. We, uh, we have run uh, out of time, but uh, it was due to the fact that the discussion was very hot. Uh, thank you for participating. I'd like to thank the speakers who read the research. Hopefully we'll see the research available at the BISS website. Thank you everyone and see you next time.